afternoon and thank you for joining us for this installment of the Exploring Sustainable Seafood Virtual Panel Series. My name is Kim Thompson and I am the Director of the Aquarium of the Pacific Seafood for the Future program. How often do you go to the grocery store and buy a package of beef or a tomato and think to yourself, is this species sustainable? How was it farmed? If I eat it, will it kill me? Often when we buy these food products that we're familiar with, we don't stop to ask these questions. But when we look through at the seafood counter, we tend to have a lot of these questions running through our heads. Well, today we're going to discuss seafood's role in the food supply and nutrition. I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome our two amazing panelists. So from all the way across the pond in Scotland, we have Dr. Dave Little from Sterling University. And from Washington, DC, we have Jessica Gebhardt from American University. As a reminder, their bios and additional resources from this panel discussion and others is available at aquariumofpacific.org. Let's dive in and start to get to know our panelists a little bit. Dave, we're going to put you in the hot seat first. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? And is it anywhere close to what you thought you were going to be doing when you first applied to college? Mm, that was a long time ago. Um, I, I did marine biology like many people did a long time ago, and I think I'm quite a long way from there. Uh, I work in, uh, in, a, in a university in a department of aquaculture. Um, it's one of, there's not that, that many of them that specialize just in aquaculture around, certainly in Europe. Uh, and uh, my role is really the, the systems perspective. So where aquaculture and society collide or complement one another. And uh, a lot of my work, because so much aquaculture is in poorer countries is in parts of the world uh, a long way from Scotland, a long way from America, particularly in Asia and Africa. Great. And Jessica, how about you? What are some of the things that you're working on and is it anywhere close to what you thought you were going to be doing when you first applied to college? Yeah, so I studied the intersection of environmental change and global seafood trade to try to understand the role of seafood in a more sustainable and healthy food system. Um, seafood trade really interacts with the environment in two directions. On the one hand, production of seafood um, can result in some forms of environmental impact. And I'm interested in how trade could intensify or reduce those environmental impacts and how changes in consumer demand and, and what we want to eat might shift where those impacts occur. On the flip side then, I'm also interested in how the environment can impact seafood production and trade through the influence on fish stocks and natural hazards that uh, damage infrastructure and other kinds of environmental and policy disruptions to the supply chain. I'd say this is pretty uh, far away from what I was thinking I would do when I went to college. I was initially uh, planning to study chemistry and art history to pursue a career in art restoration. Um, so I'd say I'm very far from, from that. I switched after a couple years of studying chemistry because I was really interested in being able to take a much wider range of classes and more classes that brought in some of the um, human dimensions and, um, and really take that interdisciplinary approach. I'd say what is common between that original um, goal and what I'm doing now is the idea of bringing together multiple disciplines to try to uh, solve some kind of um, big problem or kind of mystery. And that seems to be a theme between the two of you is really looking at those interdisciplinary um, issues and bringing those together to apply that and solve some of the real issues that we're facing in the real world. Is that, is that about capture what you're, you're trying to do and what you're working towards? Yeah, I mean, we, we work with a, a, a lot of different types of expertise. I think uh, no one's got all the answers. So, you know, we have some interdisciplinary initiatives from, from our university that bring in social marketeers, uh, psychologists, um, health people, um, as well as people who diff use different types of tools. And people use spatial tools, for example, trying to understand the geography of agriculture, as, uh, of aquaculture, as well as actually how you do it. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, we have to look at the world. The world's so complicated that you do need these different sort of uh, bubbles of expertise, but then we've got to try and learn each other's languages as well. Well, and hopefully we're going to learn some of that language today. We're hoping you guys can walk us through that. So we're going to get started by looking at 
kind of these bigger picture issues. So as I mentioned, seafood isn't really presented like the other. So when we talk about foods like beef or tomato that we are familiar with, um, we tend to look at it as food, as a source of nutrition. But when we talk about seafood, we're not necessarily putting it in the context of food, we're talking about it as seafood and often as a conservation tool. So Dave, let's start with you. Why are discussions about seafood so different from other food items that we're consuming every day? And why does it matter how or in what context we're discussing seafood versus other food items? Well, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a category of food, if we take seafood as a whole. Um, the, I think in terms of the the sort of disciplinary study of it, it's been really quite separate from what we might call terrestrial animal source food, the beef, the chicken, the pork, et cetera. And um, I think we've had our conversations internally and they, we haven't reached out uh, and haven't been part of that broader sort of food systems as it's become known, uh, discussion that's been going on and getting traction around the world. And one suggestion is, is that the, the whole narrative around uh, seafood has become wrapped up with, with conserving the oceans. And it's, it's made us rather think of the oceans in terms of conservation first, food second very often, in, in, in food terms anyway. Um, and I think there's been a sort of parallel lines discussion going on that's not been very healthy. Uh, and it's, it's up for, uh, I think it's up for us to re-engage in, in the bigger food systems debate. They are linked. Um, Aquaculture is increasingly dependent on food inputs from terrestrial systems and, and competing with chickens and pigs and, and beef, et cetera, for those feeds. So they're, they're very closely linked. And people should understand that really, that, that the oceans, of course, they have a, a huge value uh, uh, over and above food, but food's one of the intrinsic reasons why people have always gone to sea. They've gone to catch food. Um, so as Dave just mentioned, uh, seafood is an important part of the food supply. It's not in its separate silo. It is a food item. It is something that we consume. And as you mentioned also with an uh, item like aquaculture, you also have terrestrial feed inputs going into that system. But can you explain to us why the environmental community should take a look at how we discuss seafood and why we should be discussing seafood in the context of the food supply versus just as its own separate entity for a tool for ocean health? Thanks, Kim. Yeah, I, so I think one, one point here is just that we have to recognize how much seafood consumption has been increasing. We've seen a growth in per capita seafood supply since about the mid 60s. Um, it's more than doubled. And so we know that we've already seen an increase in demand and a lot of the trends in, in increases in income and where we see population growth, we're really expecting that demand to continue to rise. So I think that one key piece is that seafood production is a really uh, central and important piece of our food system and therefore uh, is very much deserving of, of taking a look from, from an environmental standpoint. But a key insight that we've gotten to from taking this food systems perspective comes from asking the question, if people weren't to eat seafood, what would they be eating instead? Uh, in some places that might mean that they would be importing high fat, high sugar foods that are driving increases in obesity rates and high rates of non-communicable diseases. While in other places, seafood might not be substituted at all and could lead to micronutrient deficiencies. So there's there's a really important health component right there, but from an environmental perspective, replacing seafood with other foods might actually result in higher environmental impacts. We know that all foods um, require some environmental resources and come with some amount of environmental impact, but when you compare some forms of seafood to other food groups, especially on, on a per nutrient basis, it can really perform favorably. Um, this is certainly true when it comes to, to water use and uh, in some cases the, the fertilizer application um, can be really, really low. And so from, uh, even though we know that seafood is a highly diverse production system, um, some of those kinds of production can be really environmentally favorable and we should look toward those as uh, potential opportunities to make the food system as a whole more sustainable. 
That's a great tee up to the next question that I was going to ask Dave, which is exactly is that link between food systems, environmental sustainability, and nutrition. And, and often what gets lost in these discussions is seafood's role in nutrition. So Dave, can you briefly explain, and, and Jessica explain this a little bit, but can you go a little bit more into depth about seafood's role in human nutrition um, and that distribution globally as well? Yeah, I can try. I mean, I think we can, from our perspectives in, in Northern Europe and, and North America, um, even though we've seen seafood demand rising and certain categories of it, it it's, it's very difficult to imagine just how important it is in the diets uh, in some parts of the world, particularly uh, uh, coastal islands, uh, coastal communities, um, uh, parts of the world that are floodplains, for example, where actually there isn't much terrestrial animal source food that's traditionally been eaten. And it's been based on what we call seafood, but we mean anything that, that lives in water really, when we, we use this term seafood. So there are really very high levels of nutritional dependence on animals from water uh, in other parts of the world that we have very little understanding of from our day to day here in, in, the, in, the, in the Western world as it were. Um, I mean, if you're in Bangladesh, you might be eating fish not, not once or twice a week, you'll be eating it twice a day um, as, a, as, a, as a typical pattern in your diet. And so it takes on a whole new level of significance uh, to your overall diet and well-being. Uh, not only how much you eat, but what types of, of seafood you eat. And as Jessica alluded to, some uh, we tended to put all the seafood in together to compare it with chickens and beef and, and pork. And yet there's so much heterogeneity, so much difference among the different types of seafood with respect to both their nutrition and their environmental impact. We've really got to start unpacking that uh, to get a better measure on, well, what should we be encouraging people to eat? Uh, what policy levers might encourage the right type of aquaculture? How can we maintain, sustain, conserve fisheries? Because they're still absolutely vital. Aquaculture is not doing it all by any stretch. Best estimates, it's still actually less than half of the world's seafood uh, nutritional impact for human beings. There's different ways to do the numbers, but if you look at edible consumed, edible fraction consumed, it's, uh, it still trails fisheries by some margin. So let's, seafood is, is a broad church. There's lots of different types, lots of different impacts and lots of different nutritional values. So you, you just unpacked a lot there. <laughs> I have a few follow-ups here. Um, no, that's great. So um, one thing that I want to follow up on, so you talked about how nutrition is important, especially in some of these middle income and these developing nations. But can you talk a little bit about how that distribution, so a lot of times these countries are producing seafood that is then going to be exported to countries like the U.S., which is one of the largest exporter or importers of seafood in the world. So can you talk about a little bit about how that distribution might affect then the local communities and their access to that healthy and nutritious food? Yeah, there's lots of, there's lots of debate and, and deservedly because it could really upset the patterns of equity uh, accessibility to these really important food sources in poorer countries. So there's concern at the moment, for example, up and down the, the west coast of sub-Saharan Africa, where people have been very dependent on pelagic stocks, uh, local fish, local fishermen. A lot of that uh, is, is uh, now going into what's called marine ingredients. And, and, and uh, some of that is going into the world uh, trade in these ingredients that goes all over the world rather than feeding local people. Coming back to, to the American hunger for seafood, I mean, shrimp for sure, tilapia, it's gone way up the rankings in terms of popularity uh, in, in, uh, in, in the American diet. And that's an opportunity in some ways for, for uh, uh, low and medium in income countries where most of that product's produced to earn income. And one of the questions is, well, is that taking food out of the mouths of people who need it locally. I would say in general, not. Um, these are cash crops that are usually uh, on top of uh, how people are feeding themselves. Some analysis we've done suggests that um, most seafood trade globally in, in farmed aquaculture products is local. It's not export. The headlines talk about salmon and shrimp going all over the world, and they do. But actually, the much bigger picture is uh, 
the consumption, the local consumption of carps and catfish and tilapias within and between developing countries. And that, you know, we, we estimate probably 90% plus is, is of that nature. So it, it truly is feeding uh, in general uh, poorer people in those countries than being, if you like, exported uh, to, to richer countries like North America. So I think in usually in good conscience, you can continue eating imported seafood in America. You're not uh, taking food away from someone else, at least at the moment, uh, in general terms. So Jessica, do you have anything to add to Dave's comments on the, the distribution of nutrition in terms of global trade and how that might impact local communities and their access to the nutrition from the seafood they produce? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, I think all those points were really great points that Dave made. One of them in there, though, was that um, there, there is quite a bit of debate around the subject, and it's uh, in part because a lot of times we don't have data at the scale necessary to sort of answer this question. And even at the global scale, the way global trade data is reported, you can't differentiate aquaculture and capture production. And you certainly can't um, sort of track it down to subnational levels in general. It makes it really hard to start to tease apart these questions. But, um, but nevertheless, when we, when we start to look at what the impacts are on sort of broader well-being and livelihoods, you really get far beyond the question of just what's happening in aquaculture. And it has a lot to do with, with the governance systems and the, um, and the economic systems in place where you're talking about. And then you start to have to ask questions about how are benefits from um, trade, how are economic benefits distributed more broadly? If you have a situation where all of that benefit is being captured by sort of larger, larger companies um, that are being exploitive of labor, then no, you're not going to see those benefits. Um, but if you have, if you're dealing with some of the smaller scale producers, or you're dealing with with companies that are distributing those benefits, or governments that are distributing the benefits from fees that they're collecting, then then you're much more likely to see those. And so that's those are some of the broader questions that go well beyond the food system and really have to do with our uh, socioeconomic systems where that these aquaculture systems are embedded in. And this is part of why it's so hard to start to unpack that that broader question. Well, and I'm glad you brought it up that way. And so that, you know, that question is, so how do we balance the need to establish human well-being? So both from a nutritional and a health perspective, but then as you alluded to, also that economic you know, livable wages and being able to support their families in terms of economics, how do we balance that with our need for environmental sustainability? Um, so Jessica, let's start with you on that question. So how, first of all, why should we in the environmental community care about these issues associated with human well-being? How are they linked to conservation and sustainability? Well, I think increasingly we're seeing a lot more people who are focusing on environmental issues, not just from a traditional conservation standpoint, but realizing that environmental justice is central to having real conservation practices. We really have to think about how are the benefits distributed, but also how are the harms distributed. And when you're, when those two are getting out of sync, where you have a, a disproportionate, um, disproportionate groups of people who are bearing the burdens and are not receiving the benefits, you have a really unjust system. And we are seeing more and more that consumers really are starting to care about this. And I, I mean, I guess this, this is sort of where it goes into, um, we're, we're not quite at the, maybe the evidence standpoint, but sort of speculatively, I think that, um, that building up a positive reputation where you are getting those, those co-benefits and you are simultaneously uh, concerned with with these environmental justice considerations that you can have a positive um, reputation for seafood production. And that is something that I think has real value um, going forward and, and on this broader global market. We can see that reflected in some of the standards that are, that are coming out around the world. And just too. to clarify, you were talking about when you said um, building reputations, you're talking about the industry, right? The, the producers mm -hmm. and, and the supply chain. Uh, and yeah. So, Dave, do you have something to add to that between the connection between human well-being and environmental sustainability and conservation? Yeah, I mean, one thing that comes to mind that's always been a point of criticism of aquaculture is that you, you know, you use fish to feed fish. So to, to grow fish 
uh, in a farming operation, one of the main feed ingredients is, has traditionally been marine ingredients that are derived from other small fish. Now there's lots behind that. Um, is that a rational use of resources? Would people have otherwise not even eaten those small fish which are now being used as, as feed? Of course, they've got other values in a marine ecosystem, but that, that has been a, a, a point of contested contested for well over 20 years and the, and, the, and the grounds really changed on it partly through aquaculture growing and having to be more competitive in the food market more generally and because these marine ingredients are, have been limited uh, farmers and, and organizations have sought alternative feed ingredients and this is a massive area of growth in not only the aquaculture space but in general animal source foods of all types um, that we're trying to move towards alternative feed ingredients that are perhaps less connected in with, with, uh, with, with um, damaging the ocean in one way or the other, and indeed damaging other, other ecosystems. Um, with that, as we perhaps reduce the amount of marine ingredients that go into our salmon and other farm fish, um, there may be implications for the value of that food that we eat in terms of our dietary value. So for example, if we, if we are feeding the farm salmon lower levels of omega-3 that come from the marine ingredients, that might in time and in, in, in turn have an impact on their nutritional value. So it, it really, to me, demonstrates that we, we have uh, you know, good um, sustainability reasons for change, but there may be consequences of that change and that we have to uh, consider those as we make those changes and, and keep the whole picture in mind, really. Well, and I think that's an interesting point. So, so looking at the consequences of change and the big picture. So you just mentioned fish in to get fish out, right? The, the feeding wild fish that's to right. farmed fish, yeah. which is yeah. a huge, anytime we talk about marine aquaculture, people know nothing else about the issues, right? It's, it's a fish yeah. feed that most people are familiar with. But what's interesting then is what about the other feed ingredients? So as you mentioned, increasingly marine aquaculture feed is going to be dependent and reliant on those terrestrial sources of uh, produce production, of soybeans, of corn, of uh, other ingredients. So how do we reconcile that with our desire to reduce the pressure on wild fish stocks, but also making sure that we're, we're sourcing from sustainable sources online and also socially equitable sources um, mm. on land? We need better measures for measuring sustainability and you know there, there's many of them and there's more of them and they're getting more sophisticated but um it's a it's a it's a moving target um life cycle assessments that look at carbon uh, uh you know carbon emissions greenhouse gas emissions for different amounts of fish or other foods produced are a good place to start but they're by no means uh, comprehensive we need social indicators we need indicators of water use and and biodiversity change so there's this is a real work in progress but i i think it's it's really got scientists focus around the world now, i don't know how you feel jessica but i think it's an area where it's attracting a lot of really uh good thinking right now yeah i totally i totally agree this is a really active space and uh, in some ways there's sort of more more interest than there are studies and so we need more more on the ground studies to be able to characterize this really diverse sector um when it comes to the to the feed specifically it is really hard to tie back those feed ingredients to where they were actually produced there are some efforts to try to follow these ingredients along supply chains but even as such it's a it's very integrated global market and so it's, you kind of get this uh, situation where if we release some pressure in one place or maybe we reduce some one problematic ingredient, some other industry might just be using it instead. So you, it's, it's really um, not quite as simple as I think some people might think. And going even back to fish, fish no fish oil, if you, when you reduce pressure on that, it, you see it being incorporated more in chicken feeds. And so they're, when it, that price is going down, they're willing to sort of absorb quite a bit of that of that fish meal, fish oil. And so it's it's not quite as simple when you get all of these inner linkages across the food system. So, yeah. and you make a good point there. So it's all connected, right? As you just said. So even if we were to magically one day snap our fingers and get fish feed to be the most sustainable source to feed in the world, there are other sectors and industries that are also looking at these resources. And if, 
you know, depending on the prices and if it works for their economic bottom line, they may shift to using those sources. So it's really important from an environmental conservation perspective then that we look at these more holistically in terms of animal feed in general. It, am I capturing that right? Is, is that where you guys are going with this? Well, increasingly, it's the same companies, you know, it's the, it's the, the, the control these supply chains uh, and they're often increasingly vertically integrated supply chains and the same company may be doing chickens and fish and shrimp, you know, so yeah, in some ways things are getting simple, becoming more simplified and some things are getting a lot more complex. Um, so yeah, hey, interesting area, right? affordability is so important, right? And if people don't have, if they can't afford it, if they don't have access to these sources of nutritious seafood, then, you know, what was the point? <laughs> so what does the system look like where we're able to have the Target and Walmart shopper who can have the same access to that quality seafood as someone who has the money and resources to buy from a community supported fishery or go directly to their fishermen? Because um, both of these markets are extremely important. They play an important function and role in a sustainable seafood supply. Um, but so, so what does that seafood supply look like if we're looking to provide that more equity into who has access to that seafood? And Dave, we'll start with you on this one. I think, you know, we, we can talk about local supplies and it's all good. Um, but what really characterizes the rise in seafood production consumption, I think, is global trade. It is affordable food that comes from, uh, from agroecosystems on the other side of the world. I mean, people are not buying catfish, Vietnamese catfish, uh, for, you know, it's, it's a, a value for money product, as is Chinese tilapia. And if you look at it in comparison with alternatives, it's nutritionally a very sound choice in general. Um, it's high in protein, it's low in fat. Um, it's got micronutrients. Um, so I, I don't like getting into this. It must be local, must, you know, it, I think it's, I think we just got to eat more seafood wherever it comes from and um, let consumers make their choice, but make sure that there's affordability built in. And we're not going to do that if we just lock ourselves into, into just local sources. It's just not going to happen in my view. And Jessica? Yeah, I agree with I, I agree with that. I think though, um, sort of adding on to that, one really big benefit or advantage that seafood has is that it is inherently so diverse that we really can take advantage of the different productions in terms of which things can be produced efficiently and cheaply abroad, which things are maybe high value products that are produced in more for more niche markets. And that allows seafood to occupy multiple price points. And we can actually increase some of the diversity of what's available on the market and reach that, that more diverse um, consumer base. And so I think there's no question that um, imports are going to continue to play a big, a big role, but we can harness this diversity, I think, to, to meet those consumers where they're at. I'll say another thing, and that is that, that you know, we're, we're still in the early days of innovation in how we not only produce our fish but also how we manage it post harvest and that there's still tremendous amounts of waste of valuable nutritional material which which is binned or not used as efficient as it might be so it's exciting days you know where the, the seafood the farming of, of aquatic animals is is recent and we're still catching up on how we can be more efficient all the way through the value chain that that will improve affordability right and i think um you know, so you're saying that we need a we need a balance of local supply and we need a balance of the global supply. But what about the size of the the producer? And as you mentioned, Dave, then we need that innovation throughout the supply chain. So oftentimes when we talk about sustainability, we focus on the small scale producer, which is really important, and we need them, and they play a really important, valuable role. But if we're talking about getting again that more affordable seafood to the masses, and also some of that R and D that eventually is going to trickle down through the supply chain, we are talking about some of the bigger players in this seafood production sector. So can you talk a little bit about what that balance might look like? And um, Dave, we can start with you on that. I think it depends where you are. And, um, you know, I have some problems with some of these classifications of, of you know, what a small scale producer really is. 
you know, you can have a really small pond or, or, or set of cages, but they can be tremendously productive and cost a lot of uh, money to keep that, that system running. So the, I, I have a problem with some of the classifications of those, of those how we characterize some of these, uh, these different systems. But there's no doubt at all that the levels of investment that are going into aquaculture globally are rising and it's catching the eye of investors of the investor com communities in the way it never did before. And that's mainly because it's the risks are becoming better known and aquaculture has always been a good place to go lose money uh, in the past uh, because the, the technologies were not well known. They're subject to many risks, unknown and known. And as our systems get better, uh, they are, becoming easier to manage. And that's encouraging uh, a bigger range of investment of, from all sorts of different levels, from sort of hot money through to people who are in there and they want to make a difference over a long period. So I feel confident that the, the successes will grow and the, the, the footing of the industry will get broader geographically because still it's fairly, fairly narrow. If we look at the countries around the world where there's a deep, you know, a sizable aquaculture sector, it's really quite small, it's very concentrated. Um, but it's, we want to get those benefits more broadly distributed around the world uh, and to get more people wherever they are in the value chain. You, it might not just be, you know, small scale farmers. Well, what about people who are adding value in other ways, whether they're traders or processors? You know, some of the people who benefit from aquaculture are not people growing the fish. They're the ones who are drying or fermenting the fish or the people selling them in a retail context. So there's space for lots of people to benefit from aquaculture who aren't farmers. And Jessica, do you have anything to add? What, what does a sustainable and socially responsible seafood sector look like where people have more access to affordable seafood? Yeah, well, so I'll turn it, I'll turn it for, uh, to the environment side first. So with, with the big actors, there's, um, there's a bit of a trade-off, right? So with, if you make a small environmental improvement or a small gain in efficiency with a big actor, um, you're going to have cumulatively much more impacts than making maybe even trying to target relatively large changes but for a small um, producer and you don't have to reach quite as many producers and so um, on the producer side you know you you can really then target where um, where you can get those benefits they might be more efficient they have more money for r d so you can get that kind of innovation so those are those are big advantages um, i think the risk that some people have when they think about these large producers is that it echoes back to uh, some of the changes we've seen in agriculture over time. I think there are a lot of people concerned that as aquaculture grows and expands that it's going to repeat some of the mistakes of the past with, with agriculture. Um, and of course, uh, there, there are many issues with, with the vast monocultures that we see in terms of disease, but also in terms of um, the homogenization of our of our landscapes. And so I think that's that's one of the concerns that people get is with these big actors, you get you can have that homogenization and you can wind up concentrating a lot of power with with these sort of fewer producers. And um, so I think that's sort of maybe one of the the hesitations that that we have from coming from an environmental standpoint. On the social side, I would just turn back to what I was saying before about these um, production and distribution systems are embedded within that broader socioeconomic system and that's what's really going to play a big role in terms of how the benefits are distributed and what the worker protections are and what kinds of benefits are guaranteed to workers and so I would, I would say it's going to totally depend on that piece which is really outside of the aquaculture system though of course the, the industry and these large players can push for those kinds of changes and protections. So it sounds like we, we do need diversity in terms of how our seafood is produced. And all of these players have, there are pros to all these players from a social perspective, but also from an environmental perspective, but there are also uh, some, some cons, some issues with all of these systems. And some are weighted more than others, but there is no perfect solution, but we need all hands on deck. And is, is that about right? Yeah, I think so. And I think, and I think that goes across from intensive aquaculture all the way through, <coughs> through to fisheries. Um, you know, if you look at the number of people whose lives are supported 
uh, and who derive benefit through these many ways, not just the consumers for sure, but going all the way back through the, the chain of employment and producing and processing and distributing. It, you know, we, we have to consider all of those in, in terms of looking at the overall picture. So although it may be seen as, oh, jobs over there, sell us their seafood, you know, we know in analysis, if you look at the value chain, you know that it's the American uh, processors and value adders who earn most of the benefit from imported seafood uh, rather than, the, than the, 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 the actors in the countries that are producing and doing the initial processing. So there are benefits. We have to look at, we have to look at the benefits in the round and the disbenefits, if you like. And, uh, you know, we can do that from many perspectives and environmentally, you know, one of the, the sort of basic tools to do that is by looking at where the impacts are felt environmentally. And that's usually if it's aquaculture through the feed. So how is the feed for the farmed animal being produced? Where is it being produced and with what impacts that? That's really important to know. And why, you know, if you've got seafood that doesn't need feed, like mussels and oysters, shellfish, seaweeds, um, they're good because, you know, they're, they tend to be lower impact. And as are the, the fish that most people eat in, in developing countries, the carps and the tilapias, they tend to be lighter in terms of their environmental impacts as well than the carnivorous marine fish. Right. But if we're looking at the bigger picture of consumption, as much as the environmental community, ourselves included, would love to see more people eat, uh, you know, shellfish, oysters, mussels, and seaweed, the bottom line is finfish is a much more attractive option, especially in countries like the U.S. where we love our meat. And so if we had people shift their consumption even just a little bit from that hamburger to a fish burger, it could still be a overall, could it still be an overall environmental win? Yeah, I think, so. of course, yeah, because even when we compare um, almost all farm fish uh, with, with most terrestrial, I mean, there I go again, you can't really compare easily, you know, chicken is, chicken is actually a, a good bet in terms of, of its efficiency in terms of greenhouse gas emissions by most uh, analysis compared to even most aquaculture. So we've got to be careful comparing like that. I, I think we've, we've, the way it's done, how it's compared, and the metrics we use, there, there's still development in that area. Um, but aquaculture uh, and the products that it produces is, a, is generally a good choice if we just want to make that level of generalization. But I think it's up for consumer education and, and actually better research to, to really do those dives in and making better, better analysis of where the where the hotspots are, where we can improve the system so that they are lighter environmentally. And that's a, a really important area to work on. Yeah, and we've, we've, been, um, we've been doing quite a, work in, a lot of work in this area. Um, one of the issues is, of course, it's not as if every environmental impact can be compared directly. And some of the environmental impacts associated with aquaculture might not be relevant on land and, and vice versa. And so um, it's, it's, it's hard to get those apples to apples comparisons, but even as such, um, one extra nuance that I think we often forget about is that you look at those bar graphs or um, plots about like greenhouse gas emissions by uh, food group or water use by food group. And the denominator here is really important. So is that greenhouse gas emissions per gram of product or is it per gram of protein or per um, you know, unit of some kind of vitamin or micronutrient. And when you start dividing it by those, by those other, other units, it really changes the picture about what's efficient. Um, in, in pretty much any case, no matter which choice you make, like beef will look bad, but uh, there's a lot more nuance when it comes to how those seafood products rank um, compared to things like, like chicken and cheese and milk and, and even fruits and vegetables. Um, so that's, that brings us kind of back to this idea about having to think about the value of seafood is often the, its nutritional density. And um, when we compare them, we not only want to think about how to compare environmental impacts fairly, but also compare them more fairly on a nutritional basis. Absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. You, it's, you, that's the point that it's so often, you know, overlooked in, in just looking through a very narrow lens that, Oh, seafood, that's full of omega-3. Well, yes, sometimes, but not always. And there's a lot more to it than just, you know, one category 
of nutrition. And we have to think of seafood as being part of a bigger diet as well. What else is being eaten or not eaten because we're eating more seafood? We know that the diversity of seafood makes it more complex. So how can we then start to unpack that in a way that makes sense for the general public so that they could start to see seafood as part of the broader food supply rather than putting it in its own category? Jessica, I'll let you start with that one. Yeah, I, so I mean, I think that exposure to more diversity of seafood, it helps consumers learn, helps you differentiate. Um, and just really takes takes time on that front. But there's a lot we can do in terms of how we talk about it as as people who are out there talking about seafood. It's easy to to wrap it up in that uh, term, um, though even even the term seafood gets debated over if you talk to any academics because it implies only marine to some people and um, and not freshwater. And so. Uh, we try, though, I think, increasingly to really emphasize just how diverse that production is and then which, which area and which grouping, I think, depends so much on, on the question you're focusing on. So if you want to focus on the environmental impacts, it's really easy to group things along that kind of the, the bivalves and the non-fed species into one area and then um, some of the fed and high intensity species into another. But then if you're going on the nutritional front, it might look a little bit different in terms of grouping things by the, the high omega-3 species, um, as well as how, this, how that species is consumed. If you look at some of the small indigenous fish that are consumed to whole, they're delivering a lot more micronutrients than uh, some of these fish that we're laying and preserving. So I think it all gets back to sort of what question and which of these points you're you really want to get at so that way you can create these sensible groupings that break that seafood broad category down a bit more. So Dave, how about you? What would your recommendations be to kind of chip away at this complex diversity that we have in seafood so that consumers are more comfortable looking at it as food? I've not really got a whole lot to add. I think Jessica's points are, are really valid. I think we, we have such, I mean, it's quick, our view on food is is culturally made you know and i think uh, certainly from the uk's point of view uh, i think you know a, a more multicultural parts of the uk certainly have different attitudes to food and to fish than than less multicultural parts of the uk and i guess it's the same in the us so i i just feel these things they they're, they're you know they'll take time but they will move through our societies um and they're enriched by by having you know uh people who who who've come from other countries and other cultures that bring much richer more uh in many ways more balanced diets with them and uh, it enriches what might be considered a traditional UK diet so that we're not just eating fish and chips uh, and, and, and certainly it's changed a hell of a lot in the last uh, two or three decades so I think you can you can have all sorts of government you know initiatives and the rest of it um, at the end of the day it's it's how the market works and there are sort of thought there are people out there who are at the cutting edge they, they tend to be the chefs and the this this is the alliances we have between chefs and environmentalists are quite interesting in the how they talk about food and about choice for sure they're very influential in both north america uh, and the uk and all of these things chip away at at, at the orthodoxy in a way um they're, they're probably not gonna have an immediate overnight impact but i think as people see there's something interesting there they educate themselves they have they can access the product uh, and it's affordable then that's when you'll see change yeah and i think that's a great point there dave too about um how much this varies among cultures and even just um language here in the us and and how we refer to it as just maybe fish fillet and and it could be any kind of, of fish and when you look across foods and especially animal products here in the US, we do tend to consume a lot of highly processed forms where the product is has been sort of abstracted from, from what it actually is. And so there might be some work to do with, with how we talk about food more broadly to connect it back to what it actually is and help people 
explore um, the diversity of what of what that that species is. I I would wager a guess that if you were to poll Americans um, about what fish food comes to mind, they probably think filet o fish, and they probably don't know, even know what kind of fish that is. Well, that's why what what your aquaria and others like it do is so important, Kim, because you you know one of your your agendas is public education, and and, and this is why it's important that you in a sense, a conservation orientated organization engage in this debate because you're making it real for people that what, you know, they, they walk around the aquarium, they look at the different fish and for most people that could be food. For most North Americans, it's not at the moment, but it could be. I, I just want to go on record that we did not pay Dave to say that, but thank you for that. <laughs> it's all right. Just send me my brown paper envelope. I'll be fine. Um, but so I want to switch gears just a little bit. Um, so we've, we've unpacked a lot in this discussion. We've unpacked uh, how seafood is very diverse and how there are different types of production, different nutrient profiles, and there's not a one size fits all of, yes, this is good or this is bad, right? There's a spectrum that it falls in. But also understanding with that diversity and spectrum that seafood at the end of the day is still a food item. It is, it is food, it is part of the food system, it is connected to the food system, and it is a source of nutrients for for, for us, for, for everyone. Um, but I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to ask the final burning question, which is, um, and Jessica, I'll start with you on this one. Can we produce marine aquaculture responsibly in countries like the US and the UK? And can we do it now? Yeah, I think, I think we certainly can in the US. I think there's plenty of research looking at what those opportunities are and kind of where they lie within the U.S. Uh, historically, there's been an issue with how marine aquaculture, especially, is is regulated. Um, there is legislation, uh, and there are policy efforts to reduce some of those barriers to uh, create the environment for that that kind of production. Um, right now, and sort of immediately, of course, it, it's a difficult investing environment. The economic crisis going on. And so, um, so that may pose an additional hurdle at this time and probably is uh, a, going to create a setback for some of the producers that have already started investing um, here, here in the US. Um, I think the other piece though that we have to think about is, is where that production's headed and where kind of where the markets are and what the trade environment is going to look like. Uh, the U.S. has been producing a lot of sustainable seafood and has a reputation for that, that reaches a lot of markets in, in Europe and increasingly in China. But of course, there have been um, some, some issues with, with trade and the current administration and their approach to uh, taking a very domestic view on that production. So I think we have to think through carefully what is the um, trade and regulatory environment that can really support those those producers and have them get their product where their where their consumers are. So reaching those high value markets will help um, support some of these forms of aquaculture and provide these more these um, well paying jobs here in the U.S. And Dave, how about you? Can we produce responsible marine aquaculture and can we do it now? Well, we are. I mean, Scotland has a a well-governed and um, efficient aquaculture sector. Um, many would would offer that it's 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 got unleashed potential there that that can with the right incentives could uh, could grow quite considerably. It's of course dominated by by cage salmon right now, but there's uh, there's fantastic shellfish as well. Um, so. <laughs> And of course, the criticism that's been lodged against aquaculture generally, but particularly uh, in, in countries like Scotland, I, I feel it's made the sector stronger in, in some ways. I mean, it's had to tell the story uh, about, you know, why, why it is sustainable. To give you an example, I mean, um, we love our animals in the UK, as you probably know, and the high welfare standards uh, that fish, most fish enjoy um, 
during their short, wonderful lives is much higher. The percentage of animals and, and enterprises that, that have higher welfare standards is much, much higher than pigs and chicken, for example. So arguably, we're, we're already uh, stepping up to that particular aspect of, of sustainability. Although if you've got good welfare, you've usually got good management and uh, high environmental standards as well. So I think that there's a lot of good reasons why we should be proud of what's already in place. And we need to talk up what's good about it in the bigger scheme of things and why it's important. So not just it's a rational use of resources, but it employs people often in places uh, uh, around the coast where there's no alternative employment. And, you know, the Scotland's very similar to say Maine from that point of view, which is one of the bright spots of American aquaculture, I believe, where they've enjoyed, you know, fast growth and quite diverse, diversified growth of aquaculture products in that part of North America. Um, let's talk more about the successes. Let's talk about how it impacts on society in positive ways, not just on our coastlines as big, loads of people are employed in processing further away from the coast and, and of course it's consumers. Salmon is much, much more affordable than it was 20 years ago. Our, you know, the aim should be to make it more affordable um, and, to, and to maintain its nutritional value uh, by feeding it well and feeding it in an innovative way. Um, and I think this is, this is where the benefits of the sector engaging with uh, the environmental uh, community uh, has, has really had a, you know, has had a big benefit and we need to pat ourselves on the back a bit more. 20 years ago when Ros Naylor published the, the, the landmark paper uh, on, on aquaculture, that was in the year 2000, we're in a very different place now 20 years on. And uh, we need to reflect on that and look at the work we still got to do. But we've, we've come a long way. Wow. Uh, so Dave and Jessica, I just, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to educate us about, uh, about seafood, about its role in the food supply, about nutrition, um, you know, your last statements about celebrating the wins and how we can start to do a better job collectively of telling those stories um, and that need to balance the social well-being, both from an economic perspective and livable wages, but also in, in, in worker safety, but also the nutrition elements with also environmental sustainability and conservation. So you guys really unpacked a lot today. Um, thank you again for taking the time. Um, for those of you, of you at home, thank you for tuning in. Please be sure to visit aquariumofpacific.org for bios from these speakers and other speakers from our panel. Um, as well as some additional resources. Thank you, and now go vote and go eat some seafood. <laughs>